All right, hello everyone. Um, welcome to our Opportunities Beyond Academia virtual panel for MCLS. Uh, my name is Avery. I am a postdoc at Purdue University right now, and I am so excited to be with our panelists for this afternoon. Um, before we get started, before I introduce everyone that we have pinned on our screen here, I would love to hear from you all. Um, could we get a just some quick introductions in the chat of your name, your institution, um, and also your career stage? Are you still in grad school? Are you a postdoc? Are you already in an academic position or industry position? Um, just give us a feel for who our audience is today. Okay, these are fantastic. Feel free to keep them coming. Um, it seems like we've got a lot of grad students, we've got a lot of postdocs, some research scientists. So we are so excited that you all can be with us. And I am so excited to introduce our panelists to you all. Um, but actually, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So with our group up here, would you all mind just starting by sharing your name, your organization, and your position, and just where you're calling in from today? Um, and I'm going to start with David and let you all popcorn around, if that's okay. Oh, sure. So I'm David Landy. I'm a manager of data science uh, at Netflix and an adjunct professor at Indiana University. And I uh, got a PhD in computer science and cognitive science um, in 2007. And I'm calling from San Francisco. And I will popcorn to Lindsay. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay. I uh, got my PhD at Purdue in human development and family studies. It's called family sciences now, but that's not what's on my degree. And I work at Mathematica as a survey researcher and I'm calling in from Indiana. So it was like, or so all the people I can see right now are in the, I'll pick Natalie. Is that okay? Thanks. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Natalie Brezak. I'm a research associate at WestEd. And I got my PhD in developmental psychology at the University of Chicago. I finished in um, spring of 2022. And I'm calling in from California, from the Bay Area, not in San Francisco, right across the water in Alameda. <laughs> uh, Dominic? Yeah, I'm Dominic. Um, I'm a senior researcher at Boundary 10. Um, I got my PhD at the University of Chicago as well. Um, and I'm calling in from uh, Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. I uh, found tens in Seattle, but I work remotely now. So I'm the East Coast now. That's awesome. I fully appreciate that we've got good representation, at least across the US, if not internationally today. Um, so thank you all for sharing your introductions. Um, and also a few of you shared your degrees and kind of a quick background. Could you all take us through a little bit about what your organization and your job entail and kind of relating to your grad school and academic experiences, what are the skill sets that you draw upon in your job? And this time, Dominic, I'm gonna start with you. All right, yeah. Um, so Boundary 10 is uh, they call it a philanthropic education research organization. Um, my Day to day looks pretty similar to what it was like when I was a postdoc or a grad student. Um, I'm still doing a lot of uh, similar research, although also doing um, different types of research now. Um, and 
Yeah, I think the, the big differences are that the, so Foundry 10, um, part of the, the org is made up of researchers like me, but the other part is also um, educational practitioners um, like teachers and program developers. Um, and so we're often working with them to kind of inspire our research projects or to help translate our research back into practice. Uh, so there's more of a focus on that piece. So my, I'm not always just um, uh, doing research and trying to publish in journals, although that, that's still some of what I'm doing. Um, sometimes we're trying to publish our results in like more uh, popular facing places um, and also like working on some like translating some tools for, um, in my case, like families and parents um, for their kids to support early math learning. Um, yeah, did I cover it? Was there something I missed or is that? All right. Okay, so we go back through to Natalie then? Sure. Um, so I, like I said, I'm a research associate at WestEd. So WestEd is a, well, I can read their description, a nonprofit research development and service agency. Um, so there's several different divisions at West Ed, um, and I work in division three in the learning and technology area. So it's a very research focused type of position. Um, and mostly what I work on are large federally funded grants, primarily IES grants, and they're all testing the efficacy of educational technology products in classrooms to support elementary and middle school students learning mostly math learning, um, some on science as well. And then I also work on some projects that are more development-based. So working with like a university or a developer to um, try out a new ed tech product with students and teachers and do some user testing. Uh, but mostly what I'm doing are these large scale efficacy types of projects. Um, and my day-to-day, -day, I will say like Dominic is pretty similar to what I was doing in graduate school since it's a research job. So. I'm doing more qualitative work now than I used to, um, although I found that my more quantitative background translated pretty well for that. Um, so developing tools to use in classrooms with students and teachers, um, like classroom observation tools or interview, interview tools, and then collecting data, analyzing data, both quantitative and qualitative. Um, I'm the project manager on a couple of the projects, so I oversee like the whole stage of the research process, which is very similar to what I did in graduate school. Um, things like writing IRBs, very familiar with that, um, coordinating with teams and um, working with clients. I, we'll talk about like later, like my advice for folks, like it's very similar to what I, what I used to do though. Clients is just like a different name for the types of collaborators that we work with. Um, I do some writing, journal article writing, presenting at conferences. Um, I think something that's a little different is that I work more on bringing in funding as well. So I write work on writing proposals, which is a little bit different. Um, I didn't do that as much in graduate school. Um, yeah, I also supervise a research assistant and, and oversee the work of a couple other research assistants as well, which is also very similar to graduate school. Um, yeah, I'll pass it to Lindsay. So my spiel is going to be similar to Natalie's because West Ed and Mathematica are both like policy research institutions um, where I think I can give a different piece of like what the day-to-day -day looks like. Um, first of all, about Mathematica, they have like different areas like health, human services, and global. I'm in the human services unit. And then within that, there's different levels of expertise. So I was hi hired into um, the child and family, youth and family group, but I've worked in, in the nutrition areas and the education areas. Um, so it's not really limited to that. And I was hired in as like the middle part of the project piece. So to help with data collection or survey creation and data management and reaching out. But um, when I first interviewed, somebody described it as like a choose your own adventure. And it is, you're not siloed to the position that you're in. So similarly, I've helped with proposal work. I've helped do qualitative and quantitative data analysis. And today I called a phlebotomist to see how much their services were and like doing like pricing and budgeting. Um, and then I'm doing code review on a, some state of code that programmers are running, which is on the analytics side and not the survey and data collection side. Um, 
One thing I'm really excited about too, is I've been pushing AI and we're using chat GPT for systematic literature reviews. So the day-to-day, -day, depending on the project, and I know we kind of talk about that maybe in one of the other questions, um, can look different, but it is project dependent based on what's going on. And then when those contracts are done, your, your tasks might shift a bit. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll pass it to David. Yeah, I can go. Um, so it's a little different for me, I guess, because I'm at Netflix, which is a global streaming media company. Probably we know what Netflix is. Um, and I guess as a result, like it's not a, it's not an academic or, or edge of academically centered institution, obviously. So usually I'm working with, well, I guess I'll say I've had two different um, jobs there over the first four years I was there. I was an IC, that's an individual contributor. So I was a data scientist working a lot on product and things. So on the website, on how do we make recommendations, on how do we situate those recommendations on the page, this sort of thing. So then it's working with designers and um, creators of those visualizations. It's working with people inside the company. So one, one piece of my day-to-day -day for that period of time, it was a lot in a way like being a grad student. It was collecting data, understanding the data, you know, running experiments, un interpreting the report results of those experiments, um, where the big difference was you spent a lot more time talking about what the gist was um, rather than trying to write for publication. I do still do some publishing, but almost, but none for Netflix, essentially. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, I moved over, well, first of all, I moved to the content side of our business. So I'm now focused on what shows we make and why we make them and who we make them for. And I also moved into managing. So now I have a team of four people that I manage. So now my day-to-day -day looks, well, kind of more like being a professor in some ways. It is jam-packed full of meetings. I think it's noon over here, and I think I'm in my sixth meeting today. Um, and I'll go straight through for several more after this. So much more talking, but in a way similar. It's figuring out what is the scope of a project? What should we be doing? What could we do? What are the limitations going to be? And especially who are the right people to get together to work on something? Um, and I guess then it involves talking like now the people I work with are data scientists, um, analysts, people who do user research. So for us, that's part of our data science org. So people who are doing more qualitative studies, more survey based methods, um, creative teams. So executive producers and the occasional showrunner or director um, trying to figure out kind of put together people to do things that are cool together. That is so fun and so interesting to hear about. Um, and David, I appreciate that you drew the parallel to what your day-to-day -day was like as a professor as well. I know I won't speak for everyone, but I think that so many of us do um, consider, do you pursue a tenure track job? Do you consider industry? How on earth do you figure out where you could fit into industry? Um, so I was wondering if each of you could talk a little bit more about your path to get to this point and what insights you could share for other people who are considering opportunities outside of tenure track jobs. So when did you decide to leave academia? How did you find out about this opportunity? And what else do you wish you had known as you were going through this eternal debate and going through the process of applying and getting the job? Um, and this time, let's start with Natalie. Sure. Yeah, I had to go back to my notes. It, it hasn't been that long. Um, it's been like a year and a half, almost almost two years since I did this. So it's still like relatively fresh, but yeah. Um, so I, during the last two years of graduate school, I started networking. Um, so reaching out to folks that I knew and then they would introduce me to other folks that they knew. And then also some like just finding people on LinkedIn and asking if they would chat with me. Um, and I just started kind of hearing about what folks at different places were up to. Um, and that was really informative for my process and thinking about what I wanted to do. Um, I, at that point was kind of thinking, I definitely wanted to continue doing research. That was a big priority for me, but I wanted to do work that was a bit more applied and maybe more directly relevant for like students, teachers, parents. Um, I know that you can definitely do that in academia too. My, my PhD was pretty like, I don't know if you'd call it like basic science. So like lots of lab-based experiments, not working with kids in schools. So I know I, I knew I wanted to kind of make that pivot. Um, but I really wanted to keep doing like a rigorous research job. Um, and I was looking for a, an environment that was really collaborative too, which again was kind of different than what I had experienced in my PhD where I felt like very siloed, like it was just me doing my own thing. I wanted to work on teams. Um, 
yeah, so I started doing this networking and I started when jobs came up during my last year of grad school, I started um, just applying and seeing what would happen and getting some experience under my belt with interviewing. Um, and yeah, mostly applied to kind of research organizations. Like I think I applied to jobs at Mathematica and Foundry 10, <laughs> um, as well as obviously West Ed and some other, some other places, including some policy places, some ed tech kinds of places as well. Um, and then I did keep my options open by like continuing to reach out to folks about postdoc positions too. Um, and then I think the other part of your question was things I wish I had known. Uh, it was a very long process, um, networking. I networked with like a lot of people, like something like 50, 60 people over two years. Um, and just cause I just felt like I didn't have enough information. Um, and I wanted to learn more and it was super informative about things that I liked and things also that I really didn't like, or I wouldn't want to do. Um, so yeah, I don't think you necessarily need to network with that many people, but for me, it was a helpful process. Um, yeah. I can pass it off. I can I can say more if folks have more questions about that process, but yeah. Um, Dominic, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, let's see. So I uh, after grad school, I did a um, teaching fellowship at U Chicago. It was like a teaching postdoc while my wife finished up um, at medical school there, a residency there, um, and then. Uh, she got a um it started, uh got accepted to a fellowship program in Seattle. And so I went and did a postdoc um in Seattle at um with Christina Olson. Um and after when that was sort of coming to an end, um her lab actually moved to Princeton and we still wanted to be in Seattle at the time. I started looking for um both academic and non-academic positions. Um and I was applying for both at the same time. Um, I kind of, I wasn't really sure what I was looking for in terms of non-academic positions and applied for, you know, more like industry type positions, more like these sort of like nonprofits and kind of all over the place. Um, and then, yeah, I was interviewing for some of those and, and some academic positions at the same time. And for me, uh, the, type of research I wanted to do, um, I felt like I'd be actually better supported to do that at Foundry 10 than the academic positions that I was interviewing with and also would allow me to um, not have to like move my family uh, to some random spot. Um, and yeah, so I, I kind of like didn't necessarily make a decision to like switch until I actually got the job at Foundry 10 um is when I kind of made that decision and even then I was like maybe I'll like apply again for um academic positions if uh if I don't like it or anything like I, I wasn't necessarily like early in my career making that decision but I do think that um yeah I, I do think that I would maybe that if I could do something differently I would start to do something kind of setting myself up for uh, non-academic positions earlier in my like graduate school career um even in terms of just like recording the things like the way that you have like a academic cv that you kind of update like it, i think it might be useful to have just like sort of recording stuff that i thought would be useful for like non-academic positions so just trying to educate myself more about what positions were available um earlier on um which i guess everyone here is doing um, so yeah, I think like just starting some of those like concrete steps early in the process, I would have done, even if I probably still would have considered both academic positions and non-academic positions, um, after graduate school and my postdoc. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Um, I'll pass it to David. Sure. So, um, so my path was a little, a little different. Again, I was a professor, and actually I was a professor at two different universities for about 10 years uh, before I made the switch. And it actually came about because I had a, a grad student who I tried to lure as a postdoc into my lab. And long story short, instead she lured me over to Netflix. Um, and what really brought me was, I mean, just the fascinating research questions. Honestly, more than anything else, like like we would consult and she'd be like, oh, what, here's, a, here's the thing I'm wondering. And I'd be like, why on earth are you wondering that? that's really cool and get really stimulated and inspired. And it was really fun. So that's what, that's what drew 
me in um, and what my path was. And again, it was a little bit weird. This is the only job I applied for. Um, it applied is a strong word. Uh, so it was a sort of like a um, different, different kind of maneuver. Um, it definitely was hard to leave academia behind. And in fact, I wouldn't say that I wholly have. I'm still kind of, kind of bridge crossing a little bit, but it was, it was a weird decision. Um, I got tenure the same month that I had to officially declare that I wasn't coming back to Indiana. This is a weird, a weird kind of experience. And I guess the thing that I wish I had known and that I would like other people to know is from my perspective, they're really not that different. Right? There are differences in the detail and the how, but like the fundamental of what you're doing is really similar in terms of the skill set and the mindset you're bringing. I'd also say like, look, a university is a business. It's got a particular, it's a nonprofit business, but it's got a business model. And the more you go into being a professor, the more you start to be aware of and in contact with that business model, right? It is really trying to sell a product and bring people in. And that's very similar to a business. And on the flip side, there are a lot of ways, I think I think in academia, we often have this idea that what we're doing is very separate and very pristine. I would argue that a business is also often advancing the boundaries of what it is to be a human. And part of what I love about Netflix in particular is I love story, I love narrative, I love what we do, and I feel like we're doing it better in the world. And I don't think that's unique to Netflix. I'm also co-owner of a hair salon and I could wax poetic about the same thing there and how much I've seen change I've seen in how personal identity happens through hair and how we've been part of that transformation. So there are a lot of ways to contribute to the world and contribute to those sort of boundaries of transformation. Publishing papers is one and it's valuable, but I wish I had realized earlier how much value I get from some of the others. And Lindsay. Yeah, I don't know how I'm going to top that. That was very beautiful, beautiful ending, but I'll, I'll transition to something slightly different. So I was in my last year of, or my last two years of grad school when I was very much like, I don't know what I want to do. I think I, I went into grad school thinking I wanted to be a professor. And then I got to the point where I'm applying and deciding. And there's several people on this call that had to watch me go through this existential crisis of not knowing where to go. Um, and actually a friend, uh, she was in here earlier. I don't know if she's still here. She pointed me to somebody that worked at Mathematica. And that person was like, had been there for a while. They were higher up in the company and they were willing to talk to me and they sat me down and they just told me everything about other alt act companies, mostly in the research sphere, some research industry, think tanks, advocacy, some corporate, um, some management like consulting. And then he detailed like general workload and compensation and identified companies in those areas. And we, at the time, I hadn't had any exposure to any of those conversations, so I wasn't even going on to LinkedIn or whatever and looking for people at that company. But once I did know was when I started applying and reaching out to folks, and I think that that also, um, we're going to talk about the positioning yourself in the interview process, but I do think like getting in the door and having those conversations and so people do know your name and recognize you was the biggest indicator like that, that was like the biggest, like revealed secret. And I was pointed to someone else that did, I was interested in physics. I'm still interested in physical activity and health. And there was someone that did a project using um, accelerometers and she was even higher up in the company. And I talked to her and I was like, Hey, will you look over my materials? And she was like, yeah, put me in your cover letter. And I'm a hundred percent certain that's what got me in the door. So like just getting those types of levels of exposure. Um, and I did consolidate all that information that I got, and I can share that with folks who are interested. It's not comprehensive, obviously, but it was like a useful like primer, and I've sent it to other people um, if they're interested. Okay, I will. <laughs> and um, the thing I wish I'd known, I think a lot of things I was thinking have already been mirrored and stated. On the flip side, they are very similar and it is like a redirection of specific skills. Um, but some of it was very, I didn't, I knew very little about like budgeting and putting in tickets for services. It depends on where you're at in, in the pipeline, right? Of a project in any type of workspace. But there was like 
a learning period of like, oh, what does it mean to build to specific projects? And like all of those things were like a bit above head. So maybe if you're applying, talking to people about those like nuances that you're like, you're, um, at least at Mathematica, I was talking about contracts ending, you're kind of advocating for your own work in some ways. And I think Natalie touched on the difference between collaborators. So I won't do that too much, but it's, but you kind of are like self-promoting and you're like, Hey, I can do this task and this skill. And sometimes it feels like a stretch of skills and it's really not. Um, but I didn't know that going in that I'd have to like be my own, like I'm my own business and I'm like promoting myself to other folks. Um, so yeah, some of those like logistics pieces were, were new, but I was also like very early career and I hadn't been in other positions. Yeah. Those were just great responses and you all touched on so many different themes and considerations that I think are so relatable to so many of us thinking about next steps. Um, geographic constraints, enjoying research, following where can we do the research that we want to do and have the autonomy to work on and pursue the questions that we're interested in. Um, but also this theme of secrets to industry and getting in the door and networking to figure out how do I get started? I, I think that that is really, it can feel very daunting. Um, and Lindsay, I love that you mentioned the idea of self-promotion. I think that even in academia, there is an element of being a researcher that is selling your work and your product to get funding, to get published, to get marketing exposure. At the end of the day, part of what we do is sales. But I think that to market yourself in academia is so radically different from marketing yourself in industry. And that is a whole different skill set that we're definitely not taught in a PhD program, at least not traditionally. So could you all speak a little bit to... Um, Thinking about the nitty gritty of going through this process, um, what was your experience positioning yourself for your current job? And what advice do you have for others that are going through the job search and interview process? Um, and let's see, Lindsay, we haven't started with you. This is a good transition. I kind of touched on these when I said how I got in, got into the door. Um, and I think it was just talking to people that had aligned work and interests. And so like most, um, I guess it depends on what you're going, what area you're going in, but most people have like those big headings of like health or whatever. You can identify folks that are probably doing work that you're interested in or similar things that you like want to pursue that you can find a contact for, or that's why networking is important. Cause if that person can't answer for you, maybe somebody else can tie you into somebody. Um, I do think that is like the biggest like tip. Um, and then I think too, sometimes with industry, usually in academic positions, or I did, you eventually hear back, but with a lot of my applications in industry, didn't hear anything, just like nothing. <laughs> and so I feel like that's like kind of commonplace and it shouldn't be discouraging. It's just like part of it because they're getting them in all of these, you know, they have some sort of filter, I'm sure, which is why I think making sure that you talk to somebody that's like, Hey, can you make sure somebody sees this please? <laughs> because then it can, it's easy to get lost. Um, it was also recommended to me to put my education information and publication record at the bottom or like a way they were more interested in the applied experience that was curated to the position rather than my publication record, I guess was like, um, another piece of advice. And then um, in interviewing, I was told that because this person had done a lot of interviews and when I did my interview, it's being able to, you can contribute to the team too. So especially if you're early career, not being like, I'll learn everything. I, it's more about like, I will, I am can do that, but this is also what I'm bringing to the table rather than just like uh, only bringing like an openness of, I'm willing to learn anything, but I, but that's all I have for you. <laughs> Like bringing, like making sure you're demonstrating the skill sets that you have that are unique, that are filling that position. Um, also in some places, be prepared to make a presentation. I had talked to somebody at, that applied to Mathematica in like a different part. So they did a lot of proposal writing and research question development. And I was doing, you know, the data collection piece. And so she had to do a presentation on her publications and they were like interested in her demonstration of methods that she used. Whereas mine was very specific to my, um, 
experience with data collection and data management. Uh, and so I, I think it depends on the type of field you're going into, but maybe having it in the back of your mind that that's a possibility or that you're going to have to do that. And I know um, Dominic highlighted like location, you know, if you're location bound or whatever, I think it's fine to communicate that if it's not just, or if they have, if they have remote positions, but what you're applying for could be remote or in person. Um, that's something that you can express. And in most, most cases, many companies are very flexible to remote working now um, in general. And then, yes, I think that's all I have for now. And I can answer other questions as we go. Who hasn't gone second yet? Has everybody gone second? <laughs> Natalie, have you gone second? David, have you, who hasn't gone second yet? I'm fine to go. That's okay. fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think those are great tips. The other, the other tip I would, I would say is learning the language of the places that you're applying. I thought I needed to like build a whole new skill set before applying. I was like, I've never done these things before. I, I, I don't, I've never done qualitative work, for example. And now like, that's a big bulk of what I do. And I actually had a lot of experience doing things that were super relevant for qualitative work. I just didn't know that that's like what they were called in this space. Um, so as part of my networking, I similarly had a, a really great person that I could reach out to similar to Lindsay, um, who I could just ask. I had her like walk through a job ad with me. I'm like, what is this thing? And have I done this before? Like, you know me, you know what I've done. Like, help me understand if this is a thing that like is new to me or if I have some actual relevant experience and then try to use those terms to describe so that it makes sense to the person that you're like applying to work with um, or interviewing with or whatever. Like it makes sense how your experience fits into what they're looking for. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily go out and do a whole bunch of other extra things. My guess is you've done the things that you need to do to work at least at a place like West Ed. I had done what I needed to do um, already and I just needed to learn how to talk about it in the right way. Um, I think that's my biggest, my biggest piece of advice. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much all I, all I would say for that. David, did you wanna go next? Uh, sure, and really strongly agree with the things Lindsay and Natalie just said, um, and and especially with this, like often you've done the stuff, and there are really big language differences, even from company to company. Um, so I definitely found that that there was this translation process that that you needed to have uh, help with. I'll say for me, and kind of going into the tech end of the world, there are also a couple of standard things you should do if you don't know SQL, learn SQL. Everyone tests in SQL. I don't know why. Uh, if you're headed into a position where you're going to have to work with data or it has to do with data science or analytics, it's just like, it's a bar you have to cross. Um, so just know what some of those bars are. Uh, that's certainly a thing that I I personally did. I had done a little SQL. I did just enough to pass the screening. Now I'm great at it because, you know, <laughs> I spent a while doing it, but, um, but that sort of thing. And then absolutely it's sort of putting your putting your skills forward um so in academia we tend to think more about what you've done um like what the topic area is what the content area is my experience is people are often really interested in that in industry in their spare time but what they want to know for a purpose of hiring you is what skills do you bring to the table so there is that transition in language the only other new thing that i would say is uh, or that maybe hasn't been covered totally before is how you build that network and what i would just say is for me, it was really striking to go between being in an academic position and a research position. Professors will talk about protecting our time, right? We talk about how to make sure to guard our time. The attitude is very different in my experience in industry where the you know people are busy, they have a lot to do, but there's much more of a spirit of generosity. So if you barely know someone or you know someone who knows someone, just reach out to them. Just ask them, just be like, hey, do you have half an hour to talk to me about industry? If they have half an hour, they'll say yes. If they don't have half an hour, they might say no, or they might just not reply. Just like, don't, just do your best to not take that personally. I think for me, and I think for a lot of people, it can be hard to do that, especially coming from these more guarded situations where you want to protect each other's time. I think they're the great thing about the, in, in industry, the, the, there's an attitude that we should help each other a lot more in my experience. Um, and a low cost to not doing it. So my advice is just reach out to those people, ask them for help. If they can do it, they probably will. Um, and if not, you haven't hurt them. So there's not there's not like a bridge you're gonna burn. 
I don't know if I have too much new to add to, to, add to um, David's last point. I think in some places, if you um, if you refer somebody to and they end up taking the position, like they get you get a bonus. So like it, you could be helping out somebody as well. Um, another reason to reach out to people. Um, I think uh, thinking about uh, I agree with what both I think David and Lindsay said about um, maybe skills being more important than the content. Um, although I, I'll also say that like, there's such a diversity in non-academic positions too, that like it might depend on the position as well. Like for example, I think that I was so like nervous about making my um, non-academic like resume so much more like different than my academic one that like I downplayed my like publications even more than maybe I had to. And then when I was like interviewing other people here, um, we were like looking for publications. So I was like, oh, maybe I should have put that, like left that on my CV or something. So it might depend on the position that you're applying to. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really just agree mostly with what everyone else said. Uh, I think the one other thing I'll say is that um, one nice thing about applying to industry jobs is I think it's an, a good opportunity to reevaluate um, maybe some aspects of your experience or, or uh, that maybe you view as a weakness in an academic context that actually might be a strength in um, a non-academic context. So like my research, um, to me, it had a very clear uh, thread. Um, but I think on a surface level, I was, you know, studying like um, uh, early math learning and then gestures and uh, gender development um, and all sorts of different things that to me, they're all related. But um, I think it made it difficult for me to make that case in like my academic applications. But then I found you 10 where I was going to have to have to be working with educators in a variety of different domains. Um, it really helped to make the case that like I can study things and regardless of the topic I can come up with like a research question and, and pursue it um and so like yeah it, I think that's a good opportunity to think about things that yeah maybe might be uh you might consider a weakness that you're struggling with on the academic job market but could be a strength on the non-academic one thank you all so much for breaking down your experience and insights into the job search process I I think that that makes it a lot less intimidating, even just knowing some of the things that you all um, would pay attention to and things that surprised you and have stuck with you since going through that experience. Um, and for the audience, I want you all to start thinking about questions that you have for our panelists. I'm going to throw out one more topic and then we're going to turn it over to you all. Um, but looking ahead now for our panelists, do you all have any other advice or resources or even potential opportunities to pay attention to at your organizations or ones that you know about that would be worthwhile to share with our attendees. And feel free to drop things in the chat as well. Um, and for this, David, we're going to go back to you. Oh, sure. So I have um, two things. One is actually a thing I left out of the previous conversation we wanted to mention because it's very specific and very tactical, which is if you are going to an interview stage with a job, I would recommend reading about them. This is something I I've done every time I've looked at a job and I think it's really useful. Like there's often news about them. They might have a tech blog or another kind of blog. And if you find out what their business questions are, when you get to an interview, they're likely to ask you the questions that they're struggling with in the moment. And the more you know about them, the more quickly you can answer. So that's very, very tactical. In terms of other um, advice, actually I have advice to people who are going on in academia, which is learn about how businesses work, even if you're not gonna do it yourself. As I said, they're not that different. And my belief, having spent a while in both worlds, is that there's a lot of stuff that academic departments and organizations and institutions could learn from having a little bit of exposure and mindset to the way businesses work. So I don't know if that's the advice you're looking for, but that's my that's mine. Oh, and I will popcorn to Dominic. Um, yeah. Other advice, I mean, I think um, to that last point, um, yeah, if, if you have the opportunity to do like an internship in the industry or something, I think that it's worth doing. Um, definitely if you plan to go into non-academic positions, but like David said, I think it can help in pursuing academic positions as well. Um, and yeah, I think um, I was also gonna highlight what I think Lindsay said before about not being discouraged. Um, I think that like a lot of people um, 
start applying for non non academic positions and, and yeah don't hear back initially um, from a bunch and like the, the whole point of me applying for these positions was that it's supposed to be easier than the academic job market um, but yeah I think it's like sort of a numbers game and like you might not hear back from a bunch of places but then find your perfect one like it's not really that um good of a signal about like your suitability for those positions if you don't hear back like that they, they could be not hearing back for whatever reason um you know but i think i don't think i have much more to add i'll pass it to natalie yeah um trying to think other things to add so another thing i talked to folks about when i was applying was to figure out which actual job title i should apply for because it's not always obvious um, and so folks who have talked to me since getting this job, they're like, can you send me anything that comes up for me? So I've been doing that for folks and you can request that too. And if somebody's really nice and helpful, they might do that for you. Um, at West Ed, my job title is research associate, if that's of any help. Um, but at other orgs, they're called other things. So good to know. Um, and then just to echo what's been said before, I feel like so much of the process is about timing. So much of it is out of your control. And it just kind of depends, you know, if you stumble upon the right position at the right time, something happens to open up, you vibe with the interviewers, like it goes well. I mean, I don't know if that's helpful or not to know that you don't have as much control over it. I mean, it was kind of helpful for me because I, I want to be in charge. I want to like determine what I'm going to go do next. But um, so much of it, you know, you just put your materials out there and, and see what happens. And um, it's not all not all within your control for better or worse. Yeah. Lindsay. I I don't know if I have anything more to add, but yes, Natalie, that was the most useful thing. I like sent my contact like, hey, these are all open. Which one do I apply for? And he's like, you don't qualify for any but this one. <laughs> I'm like, okay, good to know. And yeah, so the the language is different depending on where you're applying and that can be um, somewhat confusing. So I came from my PhD, but my end is researcher. So at Mathematica, serve it senior researcher would be like further down the road or maybe past postdocs or something. Um, I do know that most, most companies have, um, both internships and some have fellowships. So I could like, you know, not just plug for Mathematica, but any of these places I have the link for the summer fellowship. I can drop that in the chat. Um, but I know that those are pretty common, um, or available in a lot of ways too. Um, I think to answer, there was a chat about being sad about leaving your, I think <laughs> because I was so uncertain and because I had so many interests, I didn't come into grad school with like a very siloed interest. I was like, Hey, I don't know what I like yet. And then my advisor's like, well, you did this. What about this? And I was like, that sounds awesome. But I, I know that there are other folks here that are very passionate about what they do. And it's clear that's what they want their path to be. But I was more open to answering a bunch of questions about a bunch of different things. Um, so I think my advisors and my committee members were way more sad that I left my research areas behind. <laughs> I think, yeah. Yeah, I think some of you were there when... Uh, I was yelled at and they're like, what? You could have made an entire career out of sport measurement. <laughs> but I think I, I was okay with that, but that was just, that was just me. Um, yeah. And then yeah. now, oh, sorry, I'll say one more thing and I'll pass it on. I was just going to say that you don't have to lose those areas of interest. So like for me, I'm still able to do education work. I'm, oh, one thing that I did not know, the level of expertise is very different from getting a PhD in it and a faculty member position than it is if you're like an expert on a proposal. So I was bid as an expert, as a wearable device person, because I had worked with accelerometers and I was like, are you sure? And they're like, it's, you just have to figure it's more about like, can you solve a problem? And if you're given a problem, can you find a solution? And can you figure out this thing because you have similar exposure to other pieces? So you won't, you don't necessarily have to lose your focus. It can make itself known in different ways. Um, and you don't have to be like, oh no, they're putting me in this position and I'm not qualified when you probably are and the level of expert is not the same. Sorry, okay, that's it. No, that's great to hear. And I, I think that you touched on both of the questions that are in the chat right now. 
Um, so thank you for doing that. And I think you mentioned dropping maybe a resource or a link to something in the chat. Um, if any of you want to drop your website or um, a link to any potential opportunities for ECRs um, into the chat just for our audience, that would be great, but no pressure. Um, and I will go ahead and reiterate um, Andrea's question, were any of you sad or did you grieve leaving your own research questions behind when you ended up moving to industry? And I do think that Priya's question is similar. And if this was a contributing factor of how much did you feel like you were driven by your particular research areas and questions and how much do you get to focus on things that you're interested in in your current position? Um, David, Dominic, or Natalie, if you want to chime in. Oh, I see David's hand. Sure, I'd, I'd love to take that one. I certainly did, and, and some of you probably know this, I certainly changed my research focus quite a lot uh, when I went into industry. Um, and I think my answer is no, I didn't grieve it. And for a couple of reasons, one is I can still do, now I have a lot more control over it, but when I was becoming a professor, you become more driven by what students can get into your lab and what funding can you get? And for me, that shifted my research questions quite a bit anyway. So what I found was I was I was hitting the edge of what I was really passionate about and what I could do at scale. And I would say I'm still doing the things that I'm most passionate about at about the same speed I was as a professor. So I would love a dream job where I could pursue those research goals completely full time. And I would take that job. And if you have that job, let me know. But I haven't seen it. Um, because that wasn't the reality that I experienced being a professor. And at the same time, very similar to what Lindsay said, I love other people's questions. I love the questions that I get to ask now. They're super fascinating. It's really fun data sets. It's really, so part of what was for me was a pull to these other questions that are sometimes ones I would choose, sometimes ones someone around me is interested in. If you like collaborating on questions, you you get a lot of control in industry, at least in some jobs. I can I can answer quickly. So I did just write a proposal based on some of the work that I did in graduate school. So I haven't like fully lost that thread and that interest. And I like referenced a theoretical paper and my dissertation when I was going through working on that proposal because that literature was still totally relevant. Um, so I haven't fully lost that. But I will say part of my switch to this field is that I wanted to work on research questions that were more responsive to things that teachers needed answers for or you know students and parents needed help with so I kind of wanted that kind of shift um, so I'm fully happy working on those kinds of questions that aren't always motivated by my own personal interest but I am I, they become my personal interest because you know I'm working on them I think they're super fascinating and um, I think there is a little bit of space to play on at least the projects that I work on when there's time in the budget um, so you can explore some of your own kind of interests as well um, yeah All right, and in the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead and bop to another question that we've touched on a little bit, just thinking about how, it sounds like if you are looking for closure in the job search process, you're not gonna find that in academia or industry. So just get over that notion. Um, but we talked a little bit about figuring out what to apply for. And we have a question in the chat about how high up the ladder should we shoot when applying? I don't wanna undershoot for positions below my skill level, but I don't wanna to apply to something too advanced and never get a role. So how, what advice would you all have for gauging what an appropriate position to apply for is, let's say at the PhD level? Cool. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in here and say, you probably don't know. So ask someone at working at a similar job. Um, is a good way to, good rule of thumb. It's really going to depend. It's going to depend on the job. That's my my starting intuition. And then, and then lots of different companies have different scales or different even meanings to those words. I was going to say that I do think um, maybe it differs. It, it sounds like it does not differ uh, in more industry type positions. Um, I was going to say at least for positions like mine where it is more adjacent to academia and board that's like we're really focused on hiring from academia usually um that like it is worth figuring out what the right position is um, like asking that question uh and trying to apply for the one that is the right level I think um yeah sometimes people apply for positions that might be like uh I don't know, like more junior researcher positions. Um, and sometimes that works out, but 
I think trying to find the level that matches your um, experience is probably the way to be most successful. Like even if you're overqualified for some position, like that might not help you. Um, yeah. Those are great. Thank you. Um, so quick intermission. I know, I know that we could talk about this all day. So for the sake of time, if you all see a question in the chat that you want to respond to um, just by starting to type a little response, feel free to. Um, I want to get to Hannah's question because that's an angle that we haven't talked about. But before people have to hop off, I also want to make sure to drop in the chat. Here's a short slide deck that also has responses from other MCLS members that are in industry or non-tenure track positions that have been willing to share a little bit about their bios and their experiences and their contact information. Um, so open it now and peruse it later. Um, but coming back to Hannah's question, I think for me, a major reason that I love academia, or maybe it's been just, you know, born to me, um, is the lifestyle, the flexibility, the job security. Um, I'm so familiar with the benefits of academia, but, and Hannah mentioned the nine month contract breaks, flexible hours, great retirement insurance, tuition exchange. So as you all have experienced, what are the ben the benefits in your positions and kind of how do they compare in your experience to academia? And I'm just going to leave this up for whoever wants to take it. I was just going to say, um, specifically in terms of flexibility, I think that like there's a different type of flexibility often outside of academia. Um, in that, like I said, I started working in Seattle um, and uh, when my wife got a, a position um, out here, like no one had really been fully remote before Princeton, but I asked him if I could be, and like that was possible. Um, and like that wouldn't necessarily be an option if I was in an academic position. Um, so I think that is really nice and like a different type of flexibility than you might get uh, inside academia. Um, and also like not having a teaching load, like that's uh, at least during that period, you're not necessarily very flexible when you have to be um, like present and, and have that set schedule, whereas you can, um, yeah, you're, you're flexible in other ways uh, where you don't necessarily have those constraints, um, at least in my position. Um, yeah. I guess I'd jump in on that and say it does depend where you are. Like there is a real difference for sure. I'm not sure the nine month contract exactly makes a difference, but I remember trying to explain to my partner's mother one like winter break where it was like I had a research leave in the spring and she was like well when do you need to be back at work and I was like well September right like she's like no when's your next meeting and I was like well September <laughs> right and it didn't really make any sense and then she'd be like well great you want to go for a hike and I'd be like no I have to work sorry it's it's break this is my writing time <laughs> right and so it's just a very different mode of work I certainly work much less at, at my industry um job than I did as an academic in terms of hours per week, in terms of, of burden, like it's much more balanced. We also are lucky enough to get like unlimited time off. We work our own schedules. We, you know, as long as you get what you want to get done, done, it doesn't matter. So we get a lot of flexibility where I am and I'm grateful for that. And then in terms of the benefits, um, again, this really depends on the industry job you're in. I'm lucky enough to be like out in the tech world and data science. And so I just want to be like frank about it. The pay ends up being multiples of what you would make as a professor. And it doesn't take very many multiples to make up for your retirement or your insurance or whatever. Um, but uh, that really does vary by the job. David, I love that you mentioned uh, breaking this down for your partner's mother. So we've got a relevant question in the chat that makes me think of how we're all taught to figure out what is our 30 second elevator pitch? How would we break down what we do to our family versus to somebody in the field versus to somebody that has our similar research area? So the question in the chat is how do you introduce yourself in an industry job interview? And I think it sounds like a very basic question, but it is such a good one. I can, I mean, I guess I was saying that so I can respond to it, but it's a really good question. It's a really hard question because um, it 
It's very similar, but I think different. I think when you're in that job interview, the first person you're going to be talking to is a recruiter. And part of what they'll do is listen to what you say and then say it back to you. And I would just pay really close attention to how they say it back to you because they're turning you toward what they're interested in. So if you're in that position of talking to a recruiter, um, just, you know, it's a little bit safe. But then beyond that, I would say the biggest thing is the switching from what you work on to how you work is probably the biggest thing I see academics struggle with sometimes. Um, we get used to being like our elevator pitches, this is my research area. And the elevator pitch there is a little bit more, this is the kind of question that motivates me and the tools that I bring to it. That's my thinking. Yeah, similarly, I think I position myself less about the topic that I study and more about like, I'm a person who designs uh, rigorous research studies or I have like a lot of background designing experiments on a number of different questions. And the things that I care about, right? Like I really care about outcomes for students and improving their learning and testing different solutions to see which do that. Um, so kind of making my uh, experience a bit more general in that way, less tied to any particular topic. But it does depend on the job you're applying for, of course. So you probably have to tailor it based on which interview you're in and who you're talking to. <laughs> that is so helpful, thank you. And we're getting close to the top of the hour, but Maddie asked a really great question too. Um, so just quickly, what would be your all's advice for when to start looking for jobs and applying to jobs if you are trying to transition out of academia and industry? And we will not hold you accountable or liable for whenever we do or don't get jobs. You should start earlier than I did. <laughs> I started way too late. I think I maybe right before I defend, I don't know, people in the chat probably know more than remember more than I do, but I, I don't, I, I ended up working through August and then I got my position sometime in the summer. And then I decided it would be a good idea to start the Monday after I was done working for my supervisor. <laughs> It's like, yes, it's great. I get, I get paid more money right away. Um, I wouldn't do that. You should take a break a little bit in between if you're in the transition. I don't know what's safe. Others probably have what, earlier than four months because that's, that's what I did. And that was close. That was real close. <laughs> I started a little bit earlier, but I would say like when the jobs come out is when you should apply. Like it, start looking uh, like a few months before, at least at before you're planning to be done and just start applying because the more you can interview ahead of time in like a less stressful way, the better, like you still have a few months left, you still have time. And if this interview doesn't go well, it's really fine. Like I had to go through several interviews that really did not go well. And it was a good learning experience for the ones that went better. So give yourself that time if you can to just like see how it goes and learn from it because <laughs> it's all new. At least it was for me. So that, that's also, I think, just really practical advice. And we're close to the top of the hour, so I'm going to wrap this up. But I really, I so appreciate our panelists for sharing practical suggestions and experience and advice for anyone who's looking to move into industry. And also, David, for pointing out that regardless of what you want to do and where you end up, just understanding what industry jobs are out there, how different organizations run and what that means and other things that you can bring to your current job. Um, this information is really valuable no matter what each of us are planning to do. So thank you so much to our panelists for coming today. I hope that you all, all got something out of this. Um, and please keep an eye out for our next MCLS special. Thank you. Thank you.